Welcome to the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, your guide to better cricket. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you are. For a few minutes, there's a little oasis of uh, cricket coaching going on. And uh, who is in the oasis with you? Well, first of all, it's me, David Hinchliffe. I look after things here. And then uh, on the line, as uh, is usually the case, are two very fine cricket coaches. The first is the director of cricket at Millfield School. It's Mark Garraway. Hello, Garras. How are you? And more importantly, uh, what's on the menu? Well, uh, I'm very well. I'm presently sitting outside the HQ of Crazy Catch and Flicks. Uh, I'm pop, popped in there and they've uh, stuck on a second breakfast for me today. So I've had a few croissants, a little bit of ice buns, um, and that's been good. And then I'm on my way to the, the uh, ECB uh, Bunbury Festival. We've been up there for the last two days watching some of our kids play in that, which has been good, um, and watching a lot of good talent um, play in that brilliant regional festival that's organised by David English and the, uh, and the Bunbury. So, yeah, it's been a, a good week and I'm uh, uh, thoroughly enjoying it. Well, uh, you can pass on, Garras, that the um, the Crazy Catch marketing campaign that you've been uh, at the forefront of has had absolutely uh, worked on me because I my Crazy Catch is uh, turning up today. So well, well done to Garras and well done to uh, the, the Crazy Catch people for, for talking me into it. A fantastic it's, it's been a brilliant thing though and I think um, obviously linking it with Tammy uh, Beaumont and, and her yeah. great stuff within the, the World Cup you know she's going to be in that in that final on um, Sunday playing against uh, hopefully Australia I'd love to see an England Australia final um, yeah it's been it's been very good it's been very well received and you know they're, they're great bits of kit and, and the really versatile and I think that's what we tried to do within the in the videos was just to show that there are different ways of uh, utilising that kit for all facets of a game so well done you for purchasing one top work <laughs> you can pass that back to them I will they'll love it uh, secondly it's the head of cricket performance at, at Portsmouth Grammar School it's Sam Lavery hello Lavers but you, you're not in Portsmouth anymore are you uh, not at the moment no I'm about 10 or 15 minutes north of Sydney at the moment um, just away on a, on a school tour we've had um, three or four days in Hong Kong and we then flew into Sydney last night, arriving this morning, and uh, we've um, yeah had a, a quite a nice, quite a nice day so far today over on Bondi Beach, relaxing, swimming in the sea, and then uh, back for dinner. So everyone's exhausted, we're all off to bed um, early tonight. But yeah, it's been good fun to see uh, a few different sports and how the way the ways they go about preparing and and um, yeah, just generally the things they like to do. You've been having a few escapades on Twitter as well. I noticed um, a couple of little um, videos that you've been throwing up there to keep people um, interested in yeah, what's going we, on. Yeah, we do do a load of videos for the um, for the parents. You got to remember the parents do pay the money for these things, so they like to keep yeah. keep in the loop. So we do uh, we do a few funny interviews. We do a few. Uh, one of my colleagues, Andrew Seddon, who is um, a rugby coach here at the school, does fancy himself as a uh, an Attenborough impersonator. Um, so any time we're stuck in an airport um, or we're in a dining hall and everyone's kind of switched off and falling asleep, we uh, we get the camera out and he we just do a pan across the, the 75, uh, 75 young people and um, his his Attenborough voice comes out and uh, it's usually quite entertaining. Let's um, answer some questions, um, questions that have been sent into the show by listeners or by readers to um, the Pitch Vision website at pitchvision.com. How this works is that we pick out a couple of questions that have been sent in. We answer them, or do our best to answer them at least, and then we decide on the best question of the week, which wins a prize of an online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy and pitchvision.com. And um, you can send future questions into us for future shows by emailing coach at pitchvision.com or getting in touch with us on social media, which we'll tell you about towards the end of the show. The first person who has come up with a question this week is Liam. And Liam says, what changes to the laws would you make to improve club and school cricket? Uh, yeah, good, great question. I, I think in terms of laws, I probably wouldn't change too many, actually. I think the, the biggest thing for club and particularly school cricket nowadays is format. 
Um, and the reason why I say it, and you know, Sam's that down at PGS and has got a great fixture program, but I think it's it's the traditional fixture program that goes around schools, um, which is you know playing Saturday afternoons and having to travel quite significant distances to get to games and then all the, having to come back. I think we need to look at beyond our top teams. So what I see in all school cricket that I've been involved in is that the top teams can do that because there's an enthusiasm from the players, a commitment from the players, because it's a long game and our shortest game format that we've got presently in T20 takes two and a half hours where in sporting terms for Saturday afternoon stuff that's quite long you know so football's 90 minutes rugby's 80 minutes plus a little bit um, uh, you know a tennis game uh, you, you play three sets and you, you're probably not going to be out on the court for any more than an hour and a half really playing those three sets so um, I think you know we, we need to think around it and, uh, and interestingly having a conversation with some uh, people that are involved in golf clubs golf clubs are struggling with this whole notion as well at the moment because you know around a round of golf is three and a half hours four hours and they're seeing a significant drop off in the 14 to 17 uh, year old uh, age group not not from the top players because the top players will keep playing but from the guys that you hope to end up being club golfers or club cricketers in our case um, we're forcing them away from a the game because of our inflexible approach to to format so to me I think we need to come up with some different options on format in Incorporating more 2020 cricket, which I know you know it makes logistics a little bit difficult in the outset, but we need to get our head around it. But for the guys that are in the C teams and D teams, the whole emphasis of club cricket and school cricket is to keep them involved in the game for a long period of time. So when they then get to the stage where they start to work, when they've left university, left school, and they start to work, and their time at weekends becomes more about their leisure, um, then they can make some choices and stay within the game and we're losing too many people between 14 and 19 now across not just in this country in the UK I'm talking about uh, in South Africa I'm talking about in Australia because we're not adapting our formats we're just going with the same old way that we've all already gone about it so to me it's not law changes because we need to make sure that our top players are playing the appropriate format of cricket which I think we do it's how do we adapt all of those other formats to make sure that people retain an interest in the game and keep playing through that, that period of time between 14 and 19 where there are so many options available in sport but also in other leisure activities that are taking people away from the game because we're being inflexible. I think um, I agree with you, Gareth, in the extent of um, the game, the, the core game is uh, a pretty robust, long-lasting um, idea and there's some things that are certainly at club level I know that people, if you were to bring in changes, certain changes to the game, people wouldn't um, wouldn't think they were playing cricket anymore. You know, even if it was, just, even if it's something as simple as, oh, you know, we'll we'll, we'll bring in the boundary, or we'll um, have uh, eight aside instead of eleven aside because it's easier to raise eight at some levels of cricket than it is to raise eleven. So, so um, even those kind of things, which are relatively minor and don't change that much the core of the game. People start to think, well, I'm not playing proper cricket anymore. I'm not, and that is that is something that I see a lot of uh, resistance to. Um, but but yeah, formats again is another thing in in the club game where if you can if you can break away from that idea of um, you have to do it, you have to play a fifty over match, or you you know you have to do things in a certain way, then you you can keep people involved in the game for longer. So I I think I'm with you on that. I might. Um, have a look at um, a couple of little things in the laws, like maybe the idea around um, uh, what constitutes a boundary or not if someone stops a ball. Um, but I think in club cricket, perhaps that's less of a problem anyway because you don't have endless TV replays. Are you trying to work out whether someone's foot was touching the was touching the line when they do a sliding stop or whatever? Um, and, and maybe something around uh, the idea of um, when the ball hits the stumps and ricochets away that a batsman can pick up extra runs. I've always thought that doesn't seem to be quite right. But these are minor things. Um, what what do you think, Lavers? Have you do you do you see any changes that you would like to make that frustrate you about the game? I, th- I think you've kind of you've you've mentioned a few little things which are 
they're they're probably there, and they they are frustrations. They're not big glaring errors, are they? But they're the little glitches that every now and then create a problem. And and you said the ball hitting the stumps and ricocheting away and going four. I mean, the batsman can still stick his bat out, middle it, and it can go to the boundary. And there's nothing you can do. It's four runs if if it's a, if it's from a throw in. Um, obviously, he has the option not to run, but if it goes to the boundary, it's given. So th- there are other areas around that as well. But I I would definitely go on the format side of things as well um, and there is that that kind of area of dropout that we want to try and keep more people in the game and I know that some people feel that <coughs> if you kind of downgrade as it were those uh, third or fourth team fixtures or C or D or however you want to put them um, then it's taking people away from cricket and they're they're closer to being out of the game altogether. And I, I can imagine that is some people's perspective because, well, they're only playing 20 over cricket instead of 40 or 50 over cricket. So they're, not, they're playing a lot less than they were, so they're nearer to retiring than they were or they're nearer to dropping out than they were. However, in reality, is, are, are they better off playing that? They're not playing at all. Yes, they are. And, and if they're in that system and they're playing regularly, are they still more likely to f- come and jump back up to the higher level? Yes, they probably are as well. Um, so I, I, th- I think having people in, within the game is, is what we've got to aim for. And at times that will mean a bit of compromise from everyone. I, I actually feel a little bit that at the younger end of the uh, scale as well, the, the game should be a little bit longer. Um, we play lots of 20 over games with uh, under 12 cricketers and it may just be the format of the sides that we have or the side, sides we play at, against have but often there are 7, 8, 9 pretty talented cricketers in there um, and the top 2 or 3 seem to bat for the f- first 12, 13, 14 overs of that 20 over game um, so in terms of getting people to... Um, have opportunities to bat and to play at a reasonable tempo and not feel like they're forced to come in and, and just swing the bat if they're not in the top three, then I think extending that by a little bit might be more productive. Equally, when you have these teams of all-rounders, which I'm sure you know what an under-12 team can be like, there'd be eight or nine people in the side sometimes who fancy themselves as a, as a bowler. Again, if 20 can become 25, or maybe in some competitions even 30, but that might be pushing it a little bit too much on a regular basis, it just opens up the opportunity for an extra over for each bowler, which if if that's two overs becoming three, or maybe three overs becoming four, depending on the uh, the structure of your side, that's actually a really big percentage increase in the opportunity they're getting to play in competitive cricket and bowling competitive cricket. So I'd be thinking about that for the probably for the... For all the young cricketers, really, because it's not just the, the the top end ones there. That's that's everyone who wants to play. Because at that age, generally, they all want to bat, they all want to bowl, they all want to get better. Can I come in on that, Sam? Because I think that's a I think it's a brilliant point. So, in Northern Ireland, a long time ago, when I was over there, we talked about because we recognised there was a drop off between fourteen and sixteen, fourteen and nineteen um, across all the sports. It wasn't just cricket at all. It was golf. It was tennis. It was rugby. It was football it was um, Gaelic games over over in Ireland and there was a significant drop off and and so they talked about putting the format around the participants having a look what that participant needs now if you look at cricket across most countries people playing between the ages of 10 uh, up to 14 we don't have a problem with numbers in fact the numbers are very strong I was talking to some um, uh, kit um, manufacturers yesterday and their numbers of sales across the the 8 to 14 age group are unchanged and have been unchanged for years and years. The next um, level from 14 up to 19, so youth's sizing uh, has gone down by over 60% over the last um, over the last six years and that is massive and that tells a story. So if you play slightly longer format or you mix slightly longer format into that group that we've got between the age of 10 or um, 14 say 
then you are providing more opportunity because they're a captive audience at that point. When they become a less captive audience because of a natural uh, amount of distraction that they've got from doing other different things and lots of different activities and, and everything that's out there, then we need to be a little bit careful, particularly around the guys that aren't looking to make massive strides within the game, that aren't looking to become professional cricketers or having a chance to play professional cricketers. And that's when we need to put some uh, shorter formats so they can do both cricket and something else on the same day on a Saturday or on a Sunday but yeah I'm with you let's whilst we've got them captive then let's create as much opportunity within our game formats as we can and then when the captive numbers go off let's look after the ones that want to play that longer format and let's put some shorter stuff to retain interest and if we do that we ain't going to go too far wrong at keeping the numbers in the game because if we don't do that whether it's in England whether it's in uh, Australia whether it's in Ireland whether it's in uh, New Zealand if we don't do that that, then unfortunately as a world game the game will start to, to die and dwindle and that's the last thing we want I think it is, it is a testament to the game that the, the, the core of it itself you know the, the, the batsman and the bowler and the hitting the ball to the boundary and taking wickets those, those core things are, are things that you know even if you slightly go away from them um, people, people really don't like it and I think that's a testament to, to how powerful people find the game when they do actually play it so to to structure that in the best possible way is it m means that you don't necessarily take things away from the game or add things to the game to try and make them artificially more exciting or anything like that you just work on fitting the game around the needs of people as you said Gareth so that makes perfect sense to me that that it would be more about formats than laws and there'll always be a little bit tinkering around the edges but the the, the core of the game will remain the same for a long time I think Next question is from Bilal, a bit of a tactical question. He says, what tactics would you use if a team was chasing and you were bowling, but they were a long way behind the rate, even though they had lots of wickets in hand? A stalemate is going on there a little bit, isn't it? Well, I suppose it depends, again, going about format, whether this is, if it's a limited over game where whoever gets the most runs wins, then obviously that has a different context to it. If it's a, a game where, you know, you can get a draw on it. So I'm assuming that it's going to be limited overs. And on that on that assumption, um, if a side is a long way behind, and a long way behind generally nowadays is quite a lot of runs, isn't it? Because there's more and more runs being being scored in games. Then, to me, I would cut down the boundaries first and foremost. So. In most formats of a game, when you get outside of power play, you, you're allowed to have uh, five people on the fence. I'd utilise every single one of those in that in that context because, and um, if they're not going to score boundaries, then they're unlikely to get themselves back into the game. So that would be my first thing to make sure. So I'd utilise my five guys out on the fence as best as possible, and that just wouldn't be a spread. I'd want my bowler to know exactly what they're trying to bowl and make sure that our boundary field replicates uh, the area of a pitch that the bowler is looking to get in hit into so that'd be my first first uh, thing and, and often through the fact that that run rate if you get it above six uh, which most times we're probably talking about here um, then every time you bowl a dot ball you that run rate increases and obviously the closer you get to the end of the game uh, the the number per goes up the the runs per over or runs per ball needed goes up exponentially. So that would be the first thing that I'd do is cut off, cut off the boundaries. Um, and then secondly, uh, I'd probably utilise my my fielders to, to hold the edge of a circle as much as possible. Maybe I'd bring one person in to, to save a, a single, which could be that extra cover man or that straight box mid-wicket man because they're the areas that we we normally cut down cut down the singles. And, and I wouldn't be that fussed about wickets at that point. Point, to be honest because as the run rate goes up the opportunities to take wickets generally increases as well because people have to play uh, quicker they have to play earlier in their innings uh, and you find that the, the next batter comes in and he's got less balls to face than the previous one so therefore he will put his foot down quicker and as long as we're bowling to our basics and hitting decent um, 
areas in relation to our field, then that's going to become come difficult. So I, I'm a big one for for building building pressure uh, through that in this circumstance. A very long way behind the rate. Just get the rate up beyond the fact beyond the, a time where the next batter can come in and play comfortably to start off with because every time you get a wicket the next batter comes in is likely not to be quite as good as the one that came in before and with the run rate going up then he's going to offer opportunities and it comes back to and I go on about it all the time but the bit that I work on most with any of my teams is fielding because when you start to squeeze and build, build pressure the opportunities will come and if you can catch well and if you can pick the ball up cleanly and if you can throw well then you will win games of cricket as soon as that pressure rises because you'll be able to execute when other sides batters are having to take risks yeah is that that point about um taking wickets is a good one garris i i had a look at what happened last year with our team uh in terms of what happened when wickets fell and it, it is true that when wickets fall you do see the run rate slow down but it's not as much as you might think it is because especially in a chase teams are aware of exactly what they need to do so they're not going to slow down too much because they need to keep going because they don't want that rate creeping up to six or seven or eight or whatever it is in a in a maybe a fifty over match or whatever the equivalent in a twenty twenty. So you do find that that building pressure uh, as wickets comes a consequence of that, of course. But even if they don't, just purely by building pressure, um, you you're still doing a good job. You're not sort of people might say, well, you know, if they're keeping wickets in hand, they can go for it at the end. But it comes increasingly difficult, doesn't it? If you The, the longer you leave it before you go, the more skillful and um, uh, clever the batsman has to be to be able to get over the line. So I feel like um, that, that idea of building pressure in a in a limited over game is the, is the best way of going about most types of... Uh, uh, batting first situations where you've got to try and stop the team from getting the runs because pressure does bring wickets. We know that pressure brings wickets. So by doing that, you can win the game either by bowling side out or by pushing that rate up too high that they just can't do it because they, you know, they're, they're not that great with the bat because you know it's very difficult to score at eight and over for twenty five overs, uh, even if you are two wickets down that's still quite a difficult thing to do i think it's so, i think it's crucial as well to remember that whilst people bat deep and over and they did 10 10 years ago if you can build pressure that it means that the next batter that comes in is generally worse than the person that's just come out of a wicket you know it's only maybe in our top four that we sometimes see two good players being replaced by two better players but generally when you get to five six seven eight nine ten eleven every time you lose a wicket a lesser player comes in into bat and if you can increase the tempo that that lesser player is going to have to score at in order to be successful that it's got to be a difficult thing for that person and and so yeah, that's always been my language to players that have played in my teams is if we build pressure then the next batter that comes in will have to score an artificially high tempo from the word go and if that is the case then we've got a chance because he's going to offer a catch or do something silly or swing across the line um, and as long as we keep to our basics then there's a good chance that we'll win yeah, people don't say one brings two um, for, for no reason at all, do they? It does. It does happen that wickets tend to fall together rather than in great long gaps between them. Lavers, do you think there's any other um, side to this? You know, is let, in fact, let's look at it from a from from a um, a game where you can have a draw. So you've got to bowl the opposition out, but they're not really going for the runs. How would things change then? That's that's a very different different situation, isn't it? Well, I think that's where things do change. Well, ultimately, this is the kind of tactic, tactic that's used by a lot of people because a lot of people play limited overs formats. And in terms of a strategy, it's probably the most transferable strategy across all skill levels or all all teams because if you think about what is required to squeeze or to to keep the run rate down, it's very different in to what is required to knock over three people in ten minutes. So, um, you don't necessarily have to be able to bowl at ninety miles an hour or spit, turn the ball square or do these things to still keep the pressure on and build the pressure. Whereas, if you want to do something that is going to take wickets immediately and you're going to look for the strike option, 
then you maybe do need um, not a higher level of skill, but a different level of skill. So it might not just be about the control, but your ability to do something um, extra special in a single delivery. Um, if we're going to go along that route of, instead of looking to, to squeeze and keep the runs down, we're actually going to try and knock, an o knock over one or two people, then we've got to think about what skill sets we've got that can do that. So it's whether or not we have the ability to do something in an individual ball, and, and not many bowlers out there will always have the, the, the command over their skills to bowl a ball that is quick enough or moves enough through the air or off the surface or whatever it might be to do that. So then we've got to look at a short-term plan, and it's not necessarily a, I'm just trying to bowl and squeeze through my 10 overs and hopefully I can go at 3.5 or 4 when they're needing 5, five or 5.5 five but maybe I'll have a slightly shorter plan of looking to bowl something for 2 or 3 deliveries and push them into a certain position and then change the ball to a different area I don't necessarily need to be a strike bowl to do that but I can put them into uncomfortable positions and hopefully create some uncertainty about their batting or get them moving in a manner they might not want to move before then setting them up for something else so Look, it would be great. It would be um, it would be an ideal scenario for us all to have a strike bowler who is capable of walking up and bowling with that spin or that speed that can make something happen instantly, can automatically turn the game just by bowling. But that isn't the case, and 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 that's why people do revert to the 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 method a lot of the time that Gareth is talking about there. I think it, I think in those contexts, if you haven't got a bowling attack or a, a, you probably need two actually. You can't just rely on one bloke to do it. But you you, you you probably if you haven't got that, then you've got to get clever, haven't you? And um, I used to quite enjoy those situations of not having a bowling attack. And the only way you can you can try and get ten wickets is to keep the other team interested, and that was fun yes. as a captain. Yes, um, I was just about to say that. Gareth. That that was really fun because if you keep them thinking that they've got a chance of winning then they're going to take risks that your your steady old bowling attack can then pick up wickets for and again it comes down to fielding and uh, we did it against Derby so Derby hadn't won for three or four years in the county championship game was petering out into a draw we were batting quite safely we were quite a long way ahead and I, I said right we're declaring and the bowlers went bananas and uh, because they didn't want to bowl and so we declared and they needed to get 275 in 65 or something but they weren't particularly confident so they blocked the backside out of it and we got to T and they still needed 220 and we'd got one wicket um, so I walked out in front of the changing room at Derby and got Wes Durst and my occasional off spinner to bowl into my mitt outside and um, with that they I could see inside the window that they all started changing the batting order and different people were putting pads on and what have you. And Wes bowled for three overs, he went for 35 and he got two wickets. And all of a sudden we're, we're in the game. And then we replaced him with another bowler who wouldn't have been our top bowler. It wasn't a caddick or anybody like that. Uh, and they kept in the game, but they kept losing wickets because they were still thinking that they could win the game. And then the last over, they were nine wickets down. They needed eight to win. Luke Sutton was batting and he swept the ball out to Matthew Wood out on the boundary and as Matthew Wood swooped and picked the ball up I said he's going to be run out by eight yards and he got run out because he was trying to win the game um, because they hadn't won for ages and that was fun so that was a way of winning a game from something we could have shaken hands at five o'clock and got on the motorway um, and it's one of those one of those things and I used to find those the, the most fun because you needed to keep the other team in the game you needed to keep the other team thinking that they could still attack because by attacking they would give you more opportunity there's plenty of um, number six, seven and eight batsmen who uh, think to themselves, right, forget about these show ponies up the top of the order. I'm going to, I can easily score a three and a half and over for uh, for 15 overs here. That's This is not going to, this is not going to cause us a problem at all. And uh, that's when, when you've got someone in that mindset, then you, you've given yourself a chance of winning then, haven't you? Because they, they, three, three and a half is a bit harder than you think it is if you're batting at number eight and you've got to do it for 20 overs. And that is all we've got time for on the show this week. Before we leave, we are going to decide on one more thing, which is the winner of this week's competition, the online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And the two people up for the prize this week are Liam and his question about laws of cricket and Bilal and his question about um, what to do 
to win a game when you're bowling second. Which one did you prefer this week, Gareth? I'm going to go with Bill Owl's question this week. I thought it was fantastic. And uh, we took it in a number of different avenues, looking at different situations, different game formats, different outcomes. Um, yeah, so really good. Got got the creative juices going, which is good news. Great stuff. Always love a, always love a discussion about winkling out the opposition. That's uh, it's, it's a format that I don't get involved with much anymore, but uh, I still I still hark back to those days. So a bit of, bit of rose-tinted nostalgia for me. Now, Gareth, if someone was listening to the show and they wanted their chance to win the prize uh, and certainly get their question answered, how could they send their question in to us? They could give us a call on 0203 239 7543 or drop us an email on coach at pitchvision.com. That's correct. There are uh, other ways uh, to get in touch with us as well. Social media is your best bet. You can send us a message on the Pitch Vision messaging system at uh, pitchvision.com do a search for Pitch Vision Academy or you'll find us in there Um, and speaking of searching for Pitch Vision Academy if you want to subscribe uh, to this show then you can do that pretty easily by getting your favourite podcast catching app searching for Pitch Vision Academy and then clicking on subscribe if you want to get that every week that's as easy as that if you want to get the show notes for this show or previous shows or download previous shows or stream previous shows You can do all that on the Pitch Vision website as well. Head over to pitchvision.com slash academy and click on the podcast link for all the details there. That's all for this week. We hope you listen next week. But until then, have a good week. Cheers, Gareth. Cheers, Lavers. Cheers, guys. Cheers, guys.